All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It is 415, so we're going to go ahead and get started um, with today's Healthy at Home webinar. So just a few housekeeping reminders um, before we get started, um, just to remind everyone that all lines are muted uh, to reduce background noise. There will be a roundtable discussion and Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. And uh, feel free to uh, utilize the, the chat and the Q&A uh, features um, as they are being monitored um, throughout today's call. And those are both located in the bottom right-hand side of your screen. So to um, cover our agenda today, we're going to be talking about um, our Healthy at Home resources, our telehealth resources, um, improving home dialysis and telehealth, telehealth in practice. Um, we're going to hear from a home dialysis advocate and uh, from the patient's perspective, as well as um, end in today's call with our discussion and Q&A session. So some of the interventions of the Healthy at Home campaign that um, we would like to um, cover is making sure that we are promoting home modalities as the preferred dialysis option. Provide patient and caregiver and professional staff the education and resources that are needed um, to be able to deliver this um, education to patients, as well as facilitate conversations uh, with CKD patients related to home modalities and also to educate in-center um, hemodialysis patients on their benefits of home and improve patient selection processes. So the ESRD network program has developed a healthy at home resource package or toolkit that includes provider um, educational resources. Um, the first one here is the do your patients know about home treatment options, which gives a brief overview of the benefits of home home and uh, home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And these can be also shared um, with hospital discharge planners or care coordinators and nephrology practices that you work with. There are also several um, patient resources that we're going to be covering um, in the intro here, and that also includes the, um, the resource on the right-hand side, do you know your home treatment options? And this is a patient resource, and it gives um, the overview of benefits of PD and HHD um, support that's provided, um, as well as considerations for home dialysis. The healthy at home resources that um, we're sharing with you today have already been distributed, distributed out to the network service area and our patient advisory groups. Um, but if you um, have not seen these resources or do not have them, they are also available on our uh, ESRD program website, which will be giving you that web. Um, address at the end of today's presentation. So the following are also um, patient um, resources that are available as part of the Healthy at Home Toolkit, and they provide patients with a more in-depth educational information um, regarding home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. There's also an interactive mobile applications that are available for providers, patients, and caregivers. Um, our CKD provider app can assist clinicians in diagnosing chronic kidney disease and allows for lab tests to be uploaded and can also help to identify risk factors of CKD. The Kidney Choices patient app can identify if a person is at risk for CKD, provides a review of um, their blood work, and uh, any kind of previous diagnosis, um, such as high blood pressure um, or diabetes. And this app also provides patients um, with education on all modality options as well. And it's available in the App Store um, for iPhone and iPads, as well as um, in Google Play for your Android devices. The ESRD program has also developed a telehealth toolkit for uh, providers that focuses on the benefits of telehealth, um, as well as patient education and engagement, and ways to achieve success with telehealth in your practice. Some of the resources in the telehealth toolkit for providers include an overview fact sheet um, about telehealth, telehealth um, visit checklist, a reference guide, with um, additional links to other helpful informative websites and also 
uh, lastly, a recorded presentation on how to make telehealth a part of your daily practice. And as a follow-up to our provider telehealth toolkit, there's also a patient uh, toolkit, telehealth toolkit that explains the benefits of telehealth. There is also a home dialysis um, patient telehealth checklist, a reference guide that includes um, educational web links and short videos on telehealth, as well as a recorded um, presentation um, that will explain the benefits of telehealth and how to use the toolkit resources. And the launch of this toolkit for patients um, is scheduled for a release in early September. So to put these tools into practice, we um, will ask, I have asked you to download these resources, um, print and share um, these edu educational resources um, presented today with patients and staff members. Um, I also think it's a good idea to, um, to ask open-ended questions when you're educating patients about home modality options um, and telehealth um, to gauge their knowledge and also to find out what's important to them um, and allow the patient to be um, engaged in their own health care and that decision-making process. So now I'd like to introduce um, today's clinical speakers. Dr. Michael Krause is a board-certified nephrologist and a professor of clinical medicine with the Indiana University School of Medicine. His clinical interests include acute renal failure, chronic kidney disease, fluids and electrolytes, diabetic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, and home dialysis. Dr. Krause also serves as the service line chief for IU's Health Physicians Kidney Diseases. Michelle Carver is a registered nurse and serves as the Vice President of Clinical Services Home Therapy Initiative at Fresenius Kidney Care. Michelle has over 20 years of experience in dialysis, dialysis nursing care, specifically in peritoneal and home hemodialysis training and support. She currently focuses on developing and implementing standardized processes for improving clinical outcomes for home dialysis patients. And Dr. Brent Miller is a board-certified nephrologist and professor of clinical medicine at Indiana University School of Medicine. His clinical interests include chronic kidney disease, kidney transplantation, end-stage renal disease, and home dialysis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Krause, Dr. Miller, and Michelle Carver as our speakers today. And Dr. Krause, I am passing you the ball now. All right. Well, thanks, Michelle. And, uh... Thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, I do have a, a little change in my, in my bio actually. Brent is the service line leader of, at Indiana University. He took that <laughs> position for me. I am now the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Cineus Kidney Care and everybody needs to know that because that would be my conflict of interest as well. I remain a clinical professor at Indiana University. Nonetheless, I am excited about home dialysis and have been in home dialysis for a long time. Uh, and any time we talk about dialysis, obviously there's risks and benefits to all therapies and as physicians and providers of care, you need to be aware of these, you need to be consistent with them, and we need to make sure our patients are aware of these. And everything we talk about today is a care plan formulated by a physician. We're not trying to take the place of your physicians, we're trying to help you in discussions and make sure that we continue to provide good care to all your patients. But let's move to improving home dialysis. I think this is a key point for CMS today. We all know the executive order that came out earlier. Uh, we know that uh, the renal networks at IPRO are very strong in encouraging the growth of home dialysis. Our dialysis organizations are doing such, and we have new uh, access to devices every day. Uh, and it's an exciting time to provide care, so we've got to do this right. I, I've, I've kind of changed this uh, focus a little bit because I think we have a lot of people represented here, and we're going to talk to Vanessa Evans later, who's a patient and a patient advocate for us at uh, Fresenius and, and Next Stage as well. But we want to get that, in, that impression on how we do this. And we're going to focus a lot on telehealth today, but I don't think you can talk about improving dialysis if you don't understand how we look at patients, we talk to patients, and what patients need to hear from us. To be, to be successful at home. It, it's not enough to say we want people home. We have to understand how to motivate patients to get home and what it is that drives people for all of their health care, actually. And then we have to be able to provide that access to care, and telehealth is going to be a big portion of that going forward and obviously today during the pandemic. Uh, so we'll kind of try to cover all those things. 
you know, when we talk about home dialysis, it really is talking about empowering patients. We, we cannot empower patients more than to help them take care of themselves and help them understand the disease process. To do that, we have to provide access to care. We have to have continuity and transition. But more importantly, we have to be able to involve the family, support the patient both physically and emotionally, make sure we take care of the anxiety, depression, and grief and the medical problems, and especially with the start or a change of any therapy comes about. And the only way to empower patients is make sure they get appropriate information and education, which means we as providers have to understand the risks and benefits, and we have to be able to understand how to to spread that knowledge to our patients at a time when they're receptive to it and in a format that they are receptive to it. So it's very important we do that. Coordinating care obviously is key to all successful ESRD patients. And at the end of the day, when we get through that pyramid, we're respecting what the patient and the patient's family needs and desires. This is not new, this is patient-centered care, but it fits perfectly for home dialysis. It fits perfectly if we talk about transitional care and it, it is, exactly what we can provide with uh, telehealth therapy. So when you ask patients what's important to them, it's not the same thing that physicians and nurses have always thought was important. We, we jump up to quantity of life, mortality, staying out of the hospital. Patients and caregivers, when asked, it's about quality of life. It's about the ability to travel if they desire. It's, a, it's about dialysis free time. What they mean by that is not keeping minimize the time on dialysis, but when you're off dialysis, you wanna feel well, you wanna be able to do the things you want to do, and that's what patients are asking. They wanna understand that what we provide is in fact adequate and meets goals, and I prefer to think of it as optimal, and they wanna get rid of that washed out feeling. It's so common among dialysis patients, it comes up on almost every survey, so that's very important. So as we talk to patients and we say, what motivates them? Fear motivates. Fear motivates all of us. And fear is very important motivator, both positive and negative. So we can use it to our advantage, but we also need to understand what it is that's negative that's preventing patients from going to where we want. Patients fear loss. As I would, I'd be a horrible in center dialysis patient. I have to have control. So that fear of loss is important. But when you talk about dialysis, it's not only loss of control, it's the change in their relationships. Nothing is harder on a chronic relationship, uh, a long-term relationship than a chronic disease. It just changes the way we interact with our spouses, with our families, with all our loved ones, even our coworkers. So understanding loss of relationships, preventing loss of relationships, understanding how we can provide a therapy that fits into their lifestyle and provides that quality of life that they're afraid of losing is very important. And when you talk to patients in center and you say, you know, they, that fear of quality of life, they say, you know, I dialyze three times a week and I don't feel well three times a week. And now you want me to dialyze five or six times a week? I don't get it. So we have to understand that that is a fear. We have to understand how to get over that. And clearly when you start talking about going home, they're afraid of safety, right? Infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. So it's very important that we help our patients understand that and motivate. We have to assure safety almost first and foremost. You know, and, and it's presented to us in multiple ways, you know, fear, anxiety, lack of education, me not knowing it. And, and, you know, they'll look around in the dialysis unit and see people crash, to see things happen, and they'll feel comforted knowing that there's professionals nearby, and they know they lose that when they go home. And they're all afraid of needles. Everybody's afraid of needles. I have one patient that wasn't afraid of needles in my 20 years of doing this. So that the way they say that, that fear of the loss of assurance of safety, the fear of loss of safety is to say, I can't do this. There's just too much to it. I'm not safe at home. So it's our job to understand that and meet those needs. It's our job to understand that we have to deal with the quality of life. And it says barriers here, but I tend to think of them more as hurdles. Barriers can be or walls I can't get over. Hurdles are things we can get over. And to the patient, when we talk about quality of life, all the symptoms that they see on dialysis thrice weekly, they assume dialysis is the cause, not the way we do dialysis. So that, that's the one that says, I feel terrible every time you dialyze me and you want me to do more of it when we talk about more frequent dialysis. So you have to help them understand what we're trying to do is improve that quality of life. And that is a barrier we can easily get over. But if you don't understand that as a professional, it's very difficult to get that over to the patient as well. And you have to understand those lifestyle limitations. They don't want their home environment to be dialysis. They want their home environment to be home. 
and, and as we all do, right? And, and you, you want to make sure your relationships are good. And, and you, so a lot of people will say, I don't want to take it to my house because that's my freedom from dialysis. And then other, other people say, you know, when you talk to them, they've lost goals, right? They don't go back to work. They don't travel. And if we can improve those things, we can give them more than dialysis is their life. We can help with dietary restrictions, travel restrictions, and that big loss of control. So those are things we need to understand of how we motivate patients to do more and to feel better uh, and to accept home dialysis. Key is listening to the patient. And we'll go over that a little bit, Vanessa, both with respect to telehealth as well as home dialysis, but listening to the patients, listening to the family, listening to understand what their needs are, and making sure that we don't do this as one-on-one. -on -one. Because, you know, I can spend a lot of time as a physician discussing with the patients about home dialysis and the benefits, but I need the people that walk in after I do to say the same thing, so the nurses, the social workers, mm -hmm. the dietitians. So we all have to be on the same page. And w they can answer questions differently than I might. So it's very important to the patient to hear a message from multiple people, including, as Vanessa will tell us, peers. Listening to a patient tell us why we go home and the benefits of home therapies, be it PD or home hemodialysis, is exceptional motivation to get you to move. It's one thing to be a 35-year-old guy on dialysis listening to me, the doctor. It's another thing to be a 35-year-old guy on dialysis listening to another 35-year-old guy on dialysis that went through the same things I'm going through. Very motivating, very important, very good communication. Make sure we educate at their level. Don't talk down to people and don't talk above people's heads. Make sure they understand, ask them what they heard, ask them what they think, and go back and reteach when you need to and teach them in a way that they learn. Use videos, use all, all the stuff that IPRO has. That, that was great, Michelle. All the stuff you showed us is exactly what we need to be able to give our patients, ways to decide what's best for them, making sure that we educate them in a way that they can understand and feel comfortable. So we're going to move into building this home dialysis. And long term, when we talk about improving anybody's quality as well as quantity of life, we have to do three things. We have to control volumes and treat the heart because we know that's the major morbidity and mortality for our patients. We have to strive every day to reduce infections. We have to shoot for a zero infection rate. And we, as, as dialysis providers, as dialysis professionals, have to understand we have to do a better job of managing transitions. And when I say managing transitions, it's not just the patient that's starting dialysis, right? It's not the patient going from PD to hemodialysis or any of those transitions. It's the patient that goes to the hospital. And that transition home from the hospital is a huge transition where we manage very poorly frequently. So we have to look at all these transitions and any time our patient goes through a transition and manage that better so we can deliver deliver what I prefer to call as optimal dialysis, not adequate dialysis. Adequate dialysis is a urea-based definition. Optimal dialysis is volume control, blood pressure control, no symptoms of dialysis, because that drives adherence. Patients that feel better will do a better job at taking care of themselves, and it will change the whole culture as we look at ESRD. And that's the goal that we all should be having. You know, we shouldn't be saying, well, gee, can I get to 20, 30, 50% by 2025? We should be saying, how do I deliver the best care for our patients? And that will drive the culture of getting more people home, whatever that number turns out to be. Understand the benefits. Understand with both PD and home hemodialysis, there's good data to support improved five-year survival, certainly quality of life. Control is a simple one. Absolute increased control because you're in control of your schedule, you get the flexibility, you're in control of how you dialyze, you, you, you become a member of the IDT, right? You're part of the interdisciplinary team. You're able to do things you couldn't do easily on thrice weekly dialysis, like travel. You go back to work, you go back to school. And to me, when I started doing more frequent dialysis back 17 years ago, that's what I saw. Within weeks to months, people were making decisions about goals in their lives. They were going back to work. They were planning to see the grandkids. They were doing things that they didn't do before, and that was the most rewarding part. We know that home dialysis could be a safe alternative for many of our patients, and we should encourage them to get there. And in, particularly in today's world, our dialysis patients, if you talk to them, are scared. They're scared to travel. They're scared, scared to leave their house because of the fear of being exposed to uh, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, 
or the COVID-19 disease. Home dialysis, especially with telehealth, provides that sense of safety, the ability to self-isolate and reduce that risk to exposure to, to viruses. And, and it, don't underestimate that. Also use that to your advantage as we talk to patients. You know, home hemodialysis allows us to reduce ultrafiltration levels to less than eight cc's per kilo per hour, maintaining mortality, which is uh, improved. As long as we get to the proper dry weight, it allows us to keep patients at that dry weight with less intradialytic weight gains, treating things like LVH and hypertension, reducing blood pressure medications, reducing cardiovascular hospitalizations. Understand those things when you talk to patients. Give them that quality of life that we talked about two slides ago, and then talk about the quantity of life, keeping them out of the hospitals, treating their heart. They understand that. I frequently would take a balloon and blow it up and say, look, I will we can get to when you blow it up all the time. That's what we do to your heart. Show them pictures of a large heart. They can understand that, and that will help motivate more utilization of home dialysis as well. So understand those benefits. At the end of the day, the assurance of safety is key. We're going to provide excellent care. We're going to give you telehealth to keep you home and safe. My nurses are the best trained nurses in the world and they're gonna train you well and you're not gonna go home till you're safe. We understand that you're afraid to cannulate, everybody is, but at the end of the day, you are gonna be the world's best, the world's expert on a single AV fistula or a single AV graft. You'll know your, your arm better than anybody else in the world. And that is a powerful tool and will keep you safe. And always remember that you're never alone, right? So that's the other fear. I'm gonna dialyze, I'm gonna be all alone. I'm gonna lose my social aspects of in-center dialysis. You're never alone. My nurses are always available. My physicians are always available. Technical support when needed is available. We're gonna provide you with telehealth so you have the ability to see me when you need to. And importantly, if I have a good telehealth platform, I also open the world. I provide my social with a Facebook type appearance or FaceTime during dialysis, things that I can do so that Vanessa can talk to another patient while she's dialyzing if she needs that social support of dialysis as well. And opening up the world with telehealth, and sometimes we forget about that part. We only think about what we're going to spend a lot of time on today, which is that, that telemedicine or doctor patient, nurse patient visit, but it, it is far beyond that. And you want to use it to everything you can get. It helps you keep that social distancing as we talk. It may help you with childcare because you don't have to worry about traveling to dialysis and who's going to pick up the kids after school or all those things that we all have to worry about on a daily basis. It takes away the transportation costs as well as when it snows, I don't have to go anywhere. It's helpful for rural areas because it's a long time transportation and it helps all those things and it can make dialysis easily, more easily done at home and keeping you safe. And the same thing can be said in obviously transplant visits and, and EM visits to your doctor, you know, and for providers, it helps Brett so he doesn't have to go to as many clinics if he can do telehealth or he can do telehealth from his office without having to go away. He can then see what the patient's home environment looks like. You know, remember when you do telehealth, you're the guest in that patient's home. So don't ask appropriate questions, be responsible, but you're the guest, but you see what's around, pay attention to the backdrop, pay attention to the family interactions. And it gives you that little bit of extra time to spend quality time with your patients because, you know, they're not traveling back and forth, a little less rushed maybe than your regular clinic and, and helps. So I, I think we're going to go ahead and lieu of time. I'm going to skip the waivers and where we're at because I think, Brent, you've got some of that. But I think well, let's go ahead and just start the topic of telehealth. Uh, we're going to move first to, to Michelle Carver, our Vice President of Clinical Service for Home Therapy Initiatives at uh, Fresenius Kidney Care. Uh, and she's going to give us the nursing perspective. We'll move to Brent, who will talk about the physician perspective. And then Vanessa and I will chat a little bit on the patient perspective. And then we'll open it up for all of you for questions and answers. And again, feel free to write chats while we're talking. Feel free to write questions while we're talking. And we will hopefully have a nice, robust conversation after all of this is done. So, Michelle, uh, thank you. I'm going to turn over to you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Krauss. So, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about the nursing perspective when it comes to conducting telehealth visits. And hopefully I can give you a few tips that will help um, smooth kind of the visit um, 
I know anytime we do something new, we're, we're kind of stuck in the way we've always done it. If you've been a home therapies nurse for a while, um, we're really used to conducting that in-person visit. So sometimes we need a help, little help thinking outside the box how we can make this go smoothly. Oh, whoops, sorry, went the wrong way. That's pretty slow. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. So before the first visit, um, and I think it's important to keep this in mind, I know that we kind of had to, due to the pandemic, get things in place rather rapidly. But now that we're going forward, ideally when we're training a patient or shortly thereafter, have a simple conversation with the patient about the possibility for a telehealth visit in the future. Um, lay the groundwork. If you're an organization that provides devices to your patient, you even have the opportunity to load whatever mechanism that you'll use for telehealth on their device, um, or if they're going to be using their own device, you can have the patient bring it in and you can get everything set up for them so that you don't necessarily have to give a patient the step-by-step -step instructions to do it themselves. Um, but before the first visit, and I think it's really important to do some prep work ahead of time, not only for the patient and their care partner potentially, but also for the staff. If everybody kind of does some pre-work, then when you do the actual visit for the physician with the physician, I think you can make the visit go smoother, more efficiently, and get all the questions and answers done in a timely manner. So the first thing is we need to make sure that the physician determines the suitability for a telehealth visit. So for obvious reasons, we would want to make sure we see unstable patients in person whenever possible. So there needs to be an interdisciplinary team conversation about whether or not a telehealth visit will meet the patient's needs. Um, then we need to have a conversation with the patient and the care partner, if they have one, introducing telehealth. What are the benefits and what to expect? I think, and Vanessa will likely speak to this, I think my experience has been that the majority of patients see the benefits, um, especially if they've been home for a while and they're doing well. Sometimes that monthly face-to-face -face visit seems like a waste of their time. <laughs> and they'd like to be a lot more efficient. So a lot of times the patients like the idea of telehealth, especially in this current pandemic, because they can better socially isolate. What to expect, so how long it's gonna take. Um, a lot of times what happens is we do some prior teams or telehealth calls with the patient, so you can do some assessment ahead of the call with the physician, so it's good to, tell them exactly what to expect and how many calls or telehealth visits they might participate. Provide the patient and care partners with instructions. So as I mentioned, if you have the opportunity to kind of help the patient load whatever software they're gonna use, um, show them their camera, where it's located ahead of time, that's very helpful. But if you don't have that, um, ability, like for many of our patients, we had to give them the instructions and they did it themselves at home because we wanted to avoid having them come into the clinic whenever possible. A nice set of easy instructions with as many pictures as possible is very helpful. The next thing is perform a test meeting. So the very first time they're going to do this, do a test drive ahead of time with the nurse. It could be with the social worker. It could be with the dietitian. But make sure that the patient can connect, that when they connect and they turn on their camera, you can actually see them. Sometimes patients don't have the best lighting at home, and so you can kind of assess that ahead of the call um, and say, oh, let's try to move to a different location or turn on some lights so we can see you better. Um, you can also make sure that they understand how to uh, unmute themselves because we've had many situations where they get on and they're muted and they don't realize it and they don't know where to unmute. So the test meeting is really just to work out the logistics um, and make sure they understand how it's going to function and what they need to click on during certain points of the visit. Um, so some best practice to consider is um, making sure that um, you schedule the patient, and this might slide might be um, over the top of another one. Um, 
so I can't really see all my things. The best practice is um, have the patient join with the nurse ahead of time. So the social worker, the dietitian, the nurse, all those are ass assessments are very important to the visit, but they don't necessarily have to be tied to the visit with the physician on the call. So I know many of the home therapy nurses like to do a lot of this pre-work ahead of time. So they call and do a visit with the patient and do their nursing assessment. They review their medication list at that time. They go through what supplies they might need. Then they talk about, okay, what issues or concerns do you wanna make sure we adjust, uh, discuss with the physician when we're on the call with the physician? So all of that is kind of done ahead of time. Um, same with the social worker and dietitian. Many of them find that their visit can be conducted primarily apart from the telehealth visit with the physician so that then on the call with the physician that we're just discussing the items that we need to address. So a lot of times the interdisciplinary team has additional education they wanna provide and this gives them ample time to do that. Um, so that was just the same slide repeated. Whoops. Um, the other thing I will mention um, as just best practice is ensure that the um, patient has a helper when they do the visit. And the reason for that is if you're gonna try to do an assessment with a video camera, they can't always hold that camera where it needs to be held so you can get a good view. So for example, foot checks. Um, you, there's no reason you couldn't potentially do a foot check on a telehealth visit, but they might not be able to get that camera right where you need to see it. So having a helper there to hold the device where you're trying to assess is very beneficial. Um, it also helps to make sure that you have somebody else there just for other things in case they have to run and go get something um, that they forgot to bring. The other thing is just the, the prep call with the patient ahead of time, have the patient get their vital signs, their weight, everything they need to collect before the visit starts. So they have it all in front of them and that's not something they have to try to do while they're on the call with the physician and the entire interdisciplinary team. Um, so those are just some helpful tips. Um, staggering the visit, so you typically can schedule the call so that the nurse joins the call about 15 or 20 minutes before the physician does. And the reason for that is you can address any immediate needs the patient has, and then the physician just joins after you've kind of gone through some of the assessments and kind of the uh, clerical things that we typically do with home patients. Then I'd like to say try to mimic an in-person visit as much as possible. So. If you're doing in-person visits, normally the physician doesn't sit in the clinic room the entire time you're doing the clinic visit. So try to mimic that same schedule so that the physician feels like the visit is going efficiently and we're not consuming their time with some of this supply needs, med review, et cetera, and they're on the call. So those are just a few tips and tricks um, when it comes to the nursing perspective when you're doing a telehealth visit. The one thing that Dr. Krauss mentioned and I'd like to also just echo is that we can use this telehealth on a lot of different platforms. So it doesn't always have to be the clinic visit. Um, we're always looking for ways to connect and support our patients as much as possible. So there's lots of avenues outside a clinic visit that you can use a telehealth visit for. For example, that home assessment. No reason why we couldn't do something virtually to do a home assessment. The other thing is retraining. Uh, there's a lot of occasions when we train a patient and they get home and they might not necessarily remember everything we taught them. So it's an opportunity to get on a call with a patient. We're not requiring them to come back to the clinic but we can do some retraining and provide some additional education with the patient. So it's a means to kind of help support our patients and it's an additional touch point that we can certainly leverage to help patients through the bumps in the road.
So with that, I think I'm passing the ball to Dr. Miller. Is that correct? It is. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'll try not to uh, mess up the technology here. The last time I did this, I think we lost uh, power to a couple hundred thousand people on the uh, East Coast. <laughs> and like the I'm stuck to have a tornado. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to. And uh, anyway, thank you for inviting me. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the physician uh, perspective. And I'm going to try to be quick so we can get to Vanessa in the roundtable. Um, I really wanted to talk about, I've been doing this for about a quarter of a century, and I really wanted to talk kind of in my mind about the three areas of, of where we are with telehealth in dialysis, and in particular in home dialysis. One is is the, you know, pre, and that should be capitalized with the CARES Act, but the pre-patient, um, uh, 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 pre-COVID CARES Act 2019, and then pre-COVID, uh, which would have been, you know, April or May of this year. And then what are we going to do after COVID's gone? So those are really the three things I think that I'd like to talk about from a practical perspective. Um, the one of the things is the practice of seeing, you know, physically seeing home dialysis patients monthly is a relatively recent phenomenon. So when I was a fellow and, and when Mike was a fellow, there was no requirement to, by anyone to see home dialysis patients on a regular basis. Uh, it was, and so with that, um, and then this was the practice in my fellowship, different physicians did different things. And so some of the physicians, their routine clinic appointments with mainly their PD, we had a few home hemo patients in the 90s, was to have them come in every three months. And then some of the physicians had people come in every month. And then some people, some physicians had patients come in on a variable schedule. Uh, and, and so I saw the differences of that, but, but particularly in my patients and uh, my physicians that had the patients come in on a variable schedule or a three month schedule, what it did allow us to do is it allowed the clinic staff and the physicians to really bring people in that needed extra attention and then spend quite a bit of time dealing with those people that need extra attention, their problems. So I did see an advantage to, to having different types of structures and not being set to a rigid, rigid clinic schedule. But it was a relatively recent phenomenon that we started kind of the monthly clinic visit. And, and the, where it started was in 2004. So, in 2004, um, and, and anyone, I don't want to get too bogged down in details here, but basically that's when Medicare changed the payment to the physicians on the in-center side to a per visit payment. So you got the physician would be paid more, you got paid nothing if you didn't see the patient. And actually I saw this on from the negative side in rural Missouri where we had rural dialysis patients that their physicians would rarely if ever see them and yet the physician was was submitting a bill to medicare and, and medicare rightly said well this probably isn't a good thing and so they changed the payment model to where the physician had to see a dialysis patient once a month so if you didn't see the dialysis patient during the month you got zero for one visit on an in-center hemo patient, you got a payment. You got paid a little bit more for two or three, which were the same, and then you got paid the most for four. And then for the home patients, you can see here is the quote, we did not initially specify a frequency of required visits for home dialysis, monthly capitation payment services, that's the physician payment, but we expect physicians to provide clinically appropriate care to manage the dialysis home patient. So they still did not prescribe that you needed to see monthly. And then there was a little bit of a difference of opinion between the, at then the fiscal intermediaries, now the medic, uh, Medicare contractors about what that should be. Then in 2011, and I won't read this to you, you know, you can read it on your own, but basically they said, now we expect home dialysis patients to be seen monthly in order for the physician to get paid. And then there was also some language in there that the dialysis provider needs to make sure that the patient is seen monthly. 
and I won't belabor that point. And so the monthly clinic as a standard has come about in the last 10 to 15 years because of these regulations, not because there was any brilliant study or a recognition that this is best practices or, or anything else. Um, it's a regulatory issue. Um, and so that's the pre-CARES Act. That's, that's where we went um, up until 2019. Now, I, I, this is a, 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 a title slide from a presentation that my good friend, Eric Wallace, who's at UAB, and he actually has done so much work in this. They named him the, he's a nephrologist, but they named him the medical director of all of telehealth for the entire University of Alabama system, which is a big job. And uh, I told him not to take it. Um, I'll have to talk to him to see if he still regrets it. But he gave his presentation for five or six years every year at our annual dialysis conference and in the American Society of Nephrology meeting and talked about if you're going to do telehealth in home dialysis, how do you do it? And basically, there are all these regulations about who's eligible and how you did it and the equipment you needed and how you bill it and how you document it. And it was impossible. I mean, anyone who attended that was like, wow, this is a lot of work. And no one really, I would say no one, very few people actually did it. Um, and so you had to have all this stuff. You had to have originating sites. You had to be one of these people. You couldn't do it in the dialysis unit, so forth and so on. Um, and then that changes with the Chronic Act in 2017. So this passed Congress in 2017, and it allows for telehealth and home dialysis patients with certain rules. It starts in January 2019. Um, I, like Mike, like Michelle, consider myself an early adapter to things like this on patient care. Um, and despite me being an early adapter, um, the, the two dialysis units that I'm most aligned with, one in St. Louis and now one here in Indiana. Uh, in St. Louis, we had zero people on telehealth, despite the fact that we were allowed to um, starting in January 2019. After a year of effort in Indianapolis, 7%. And that was with a lot of people working pretty hard to try to get this going. So that is from 2019 until April of this year. So, you know, a year and a half, a little bit over a year of work and an early adapter with a lot of support, um, including equipment, staff, and so, so forth, 7%. So then we have COVID hit and CMS changes the rules dramatically. And I won't belabor the point because no one really wants to hear about rules, but they, they change the rules. And the question is, will this be temporarily or will this continue? My, when people ask me this question, I say the genie's out of the bottle, and I think this is going to be relatively permanent. Um, but all of a sudden, um, now, after a 15 months of work and having 7% of patients, within four weeks, 90% of our patients in the home dialysis unit in Indianapolis are doing telehealth. Within four weeks in St. Louis at, at my old unit, 50% um, of people are doing tele. They went from zero to 50 in four weeks. We went from seven to 90 in four weeks. So it can be done and, and fairly successful. So that's where we are now. So we have a technology that works, kind of. Um, we have a regulatory and reimbursement infrastructure that is maybe not optimal, but it's certainly functional. It's working. Um, and so what do we do now? And so I think really where those of us who are invested in home dialysis really have an opportunity is let's re-envision what that monthly clinic visit is, both in telehealth and in person. And let's just not try to replicate the monthly clinic visit remotely. Um, I feel like we had to do that on a, a, a pandemic level spring, but you know, speaking into next year, let's figure out how we can do it differently and, and what does telehealth do? And then I think one of the next steps is we have to improve the technology. I um, mean, I'd, I'd be interested in what Vanessa is going to say about this. Vanessa is pretty technologically adept, but um, I was on a telehealth call at, at 3.30 today, right before this, and 
the patient could not figure out how to unmute themselves. That telehealth visit didn't go very well. And, um, you know, it, it, so we have to figure out the technology and the usability and making it work. But I really think we have an opportunity to rethink this visit. And I'll leave it at that. And I'm really interested in hearing what Vanessa says. Um, and if she could answer at the end of her presentation, I'd like to hear her thoughts on some of my questions. Are you ready to go? I'm ready. Excellent. Let's do this. Let's do this. this why, why don't you take a few moments just to tell us about uh, your journey? I, I know it's a long journey, so that yeah. you'll, you'll shorten it for me. But I think sure. it's an important journey for everybody here. Sure. So first, I, I also need to disclose that um, I my name is Vanessa Evans. I'm the Senior Manager of Advocacy and Communications for Fresenius. But um, my, my other life or my, my parallel life is I am a dialysis patient for probably almost 23 years now, straight. Um, I, I have high hand antibodies, so it makes it very difficult for me to receive and get that, you know, wanted kidney transplant that so many of us, you know, strive for. So meanwhile, I have been doing dialysis at home now for about 15 years, but I actually started my dialysis journey in center, and I did in center for eight years before I transitioned home. So I'm a professional dialysis patient. <laughs> if there ever was one, I'm that person. <laughs> yeah. So my story began when I was about, uh, I guess I was about 12 years old. Um, I, by the way, didn't have any underlying health condition. I, I am not a diabetic, um, nor do I have lupus or other underlying health conditions, high blood pressure, et cetera. Um, I found out that I needed dialysis actually kind of by a fluke. I just had my normal uh, doctor's appointment where I was getting my yearly checkup and they did some blood work and they saw that I was very anemic. And so I was actually given iron pills um, and I was on that for a number of months and my iron stores never went up. And so further investigation, kidney biopsy, uh, found out that I had kidney disease. I, I, you know, it's a silent, we know now, or I know now, um, it's kind of creeps up on you. It's a, a silent disease. So I had no idea that this was going on. Uh, I was told that I was going to need a kidney transplant. I did receive my kidney transplant from my mom um, right when I graduated high school. And so that was before I started dialysis. So I went right, you know, right into kidney transplant. That lasted me about five and a half years. I was able to go to college and, and do a study abroad, but uh, admittedly, you know, transplant was also difficult. I was on high immunosuppressants, um, didn't always feel so great, but really always worked and strived to do the best I could. Uh, upon graduating college, I, I started like any other, you know, college grad. I moved in with a bunch of girlfriends, got an apartment, had a new job and was living kind of a normal life, I guess, but I was transplanted at this point. And all of a sudden I really started not to feel well. My blood pressure got really high. Um, I felt really tired. I actually kept a diary then where I would write, like I can't even get up and walk from like my computer, you know, to the refrigerator. I was really tired, was really not feeling well. And I was told that I was gonna start dialysis. And I didn't have really any education at all about dialysis. Um, in my mind, I actually thought, oh, I can just kind of go when I want to go. Like, I can go Monday at 9, and, you know, maybe I'll go Wednesday at 10. And I, I did not understand at all what dialysis was, you know, how it was going to impact my life. Um, I should also preference that I actually didn't understand really anything about kidney disease or even transplant or you know, I thought, oh, I get a transplant and life goes on. I did not understand the overall health and life of well-being impact that this was going to have for, for really the rest of my life. So um, I basically started in center. Um, like I said, I did eight years. I went Monday, Wednesday, Friday. My schedule was three hours at a time. But as we all know, it's not three hours. It's really five hours for me it was because there was time getting there. There was time waiting to get on the machine. There was time waiting to get off the machine. Uh, I felt horrible after my treatment. Um, I really didn't have much energy. And 
I was in a, in a very bad space. I had to quit my job. I had to move back in with my, my parents. Um, you know, this was also monetarily difficult. I was on a bunch of medications, so I had to pay for all those out of pocket. And if you remember, I quit my job, so I didn't have insurance. Um, it, was, it was a very difficult time, um, but I, I did kind of persevere and I did start doing part-time work and, and kind of get into it. But I knew, I knew Dr. Kraus that I wanted to find a better way um, but honestly, it wasn't until the birth of my son, who now, by the way, is 15 years old and is a <laughs> sophomore, um, who's taller than me, although that's not too hard. Um, it wasn't until he was born that I was like, okay, I really need to find a better way. Um, and I discovered home dialysis on my own at that time. Like, you know, what we're doing now, there was no virtual calls. There was no patient advocate. My doctor didn't tell me about it. Um, you know, it was really as if it didn't exist. I actually didn't even know about PD. I knew nothing about anything. So um, fast forward, you know, I, I've now been home close to 15 years now. Um, and honestly, for me, it completely changed my life. I got off my blood pressure pills within three days. I mean, you know, Dr. Krauss, I work full time and, um, you know, I'm a mom to these two crazy teenage boys right now. And, you know, so thankful to be home during COVID that I can do my treatments in the comfort of my own home uh, and not have to leave. And you know, really happy to be joining you guys today to really give a patient perspective. And I'm really hoping that some of the people on the line will ask me questions um, just regarding not only my own journey, but you know, how do patients feel? How do you talk to patients? You know, how do we get them home? And I'm really here to help enlighten those conversations. So thank you for having me. Oh, thanks. So we'll get to where telehealth fits in your world, but let's let's talk a little bit more about home dialysis and even being empowered. Going back to that picker slide I showed about uh, patient empowerment. You know, it, it sounds to me when you were put on hemodialysis, you had none of that. Yeah, I really didn't have any of that. Um, I didn't even really know that I could be a part of my care. I mean, the only thing that I really did was ask them to turn the machine so I could literally count down the hours, you know, how, how much longer till I was here. I, I opened my mouth, they put the thermometer in my mouth, I put my arm out, you know, my blood pressure was taken, I turned my head the other way, the needles were put in, and then I would say, can you just turn the machine so I can count down the hours, you know, and they would, they would turn it. I, I really had nothing to do with my treatment. Um, I personally think that patients, unfortunately, were really not empowered to, to really understand our treatment, even if you don't go home, even just being involved in your care. I didn't know what venous pressure was. I didn't know what arterial pressure was. I didn't know, I didn't, know, I didn't even know what my blood flow was. Um, I, I really didn't know any of that, which now, I mean, if you were to ask me, I can tell you what I run, what my, right. you know, but I am like an expert on it. Um, and I'm so happy that I am because I really feel like it changed the trajectory of my life and that here I am you know, 23 years later, and, you know, I'm not going to pretend that everything is always unicorns and rainbows. There's certainly difficulties, but in general, I, I feel pretty well, and I think if you were to see me and look at me and just talk to me, you wouldn't necessarily, you know, know that I'm a patient um, all the time. And so that really changed when I was able to go home and start to understand that, and, and then I'm going to tell you that when I started to do my needles, I was like, oh, my God, why, <laughs> why for eight years would, did I never do this? You know, why was I giving, letting somebody else do this instead of me? Nobody's going to know better than me, right? Like, I'm not going to, I'll know right away if the needle doesn't seem right. I'll know right away if something is not correct. And, you know, meanwhile, I went through infiltration, infiltration. My arm would be black and blue. They'd go in the same spot. You know, all these things that I could have maybe deterred had I ever been given the knowledge or the power to be able to do that. And, and you know, for eight years, I, I didn't know about it. And honestly, I didn't know enough to ask. Right. I, I didn't so, know enough to ask, yeah. So what was your greatest motivator to get you to go home? Because you had to do a lot on your own. And what was your biggest fear about going home? Oh, my God. I had so many fears about going home. So, <laughs> like, honestly, so first of all, it's not like I was like, oh, home dialysis, I'm going to do it tomorrow. No, I, I, I found out about home 
And then it took me a year to go home, literally a year. And I remember because I actually had to change my doctor, my clinic, my unit, like everything. I, in order for me to go home, it wasn't even being offered at my unit. So I had to leave everything that I knew. And by the way, you know, my doctor, my staff, my addition, they were part of my life. Like they, some of them came to my wedding. They were there like for celebrations. They were when my first, you know, born was, the son was born. They came to a party we had because that was like, I could do a whole other webinar on how to <laughs> have a child and be on dialysis. But anyway, um, you know, so that part was difficult to leave them because I think what you said, that, that sense of security, um, you know, what if there's an emergency? And, you know, let me tell you, I saw people pass out. I myself passed out. I saw, I had cramps, you know, those horrible cramps that you get in your leg. I had thrown up. I had seen people thrown up. I've seen people code. Um, so then, you know, you're like, oh, why don't you do this at home? I'm like, uh, you know, yes, but I don't know about that. So, so it did take me a year. My motivating factor was my son. Um, and I'm going to tell you what really, though, brought me over the, the threshold is I had the most amazing tech uh, that really was like, Vanessa, you need to go home. You can do this. You've got this. And he was like, you need to just start by watching me put in the needles because you don't even watch like I didn't watch that. Right. So mm -hmm. I don't know anything about that. So I started a few weeks, honestly, just watching him do it. Then we did what they call the guided method, where I would put my hand over his and, and he would, you know, he was essentially putting the needles in, but I was kind of learning and I kind of felt like I was getting that empowerment of learning to do that. Um, and then we actually went to pulling the needles out before we put them in. And, and it's funny that we did that because honestly, pulling the needles out is actually, I think, harder than pulling them in because. Absolutely. You're actually bleeding at that point, right? <laughs> you have to be the one that has to figure that out. So we did that. And, and then, you know, I remember the day he's like, we're going to put the needles in today. You're doing this. And I, I said to him, do not leave me stand right here. You know, what if something goes wrong? And, and then from there on in, I just started doing it. And it was kind of like, again, why did I not do this from the beginning? Because I knew. A couple times that I've had issues, I, I know right away. So I can, I can pull that needle or fix it if I need to before it ever infiltrates or it actually is like hurting me. Um, in terms of supplies, you know, you, you learn as you go. I thought that I wanted to be in a private room kind of by myself in the back and I learned, nope, I want to be where my family is watching TV and hanging out with everybody. So I moved it. I mean, what I love about our system is that it's portable. And, you know, honestly, I, I could even move it, you know, today, if I wanted to move it into my bedroom or family room, I can do that. Um, but these are all things that I didn't know. And I was so nervous about, and there was nobody to speak to, by the way. And honestly, one of the greatest gifts that you can do for your patients is have them speak with an advocate that has been doing home successfully. Because there's nothing better, like you said in the beginning, with somebody speaking to a patient that is like them, that understands them. And, you know, that, that is a gift that I did not have. And so I was just kind of doing a leap of faith that I needed and wanted to do this. But now I, I'm thankful that we have all these advocates that they can speak live and in person with patients when they want to know kind of the questions that you're asking. And nobody knows better than someone that's done it, you know? I agree. So you, you, you've done well, obviously, but motivated. You've developed a life. You've got goals. You're raising children. Uh, you've got a full-time job. You travel a lot. It's impressive. But now it comes to 2020. Yeah. And, and the pandemic hits. And SARS-CoV-2 becomes a reality. As a dialysis patient, what, how does that make you feel? Well, I'm going to be honest. I mean, like, super petrified. I... I, I you know, try to read and look at all the clinical data that I can find specifically to home dialysis. Um, but I, I am so thankful that I am doing home dialysis because, I mean, I'm not going into a clinic three days a week. To be honest with you, I'm not going at all. I know we're going to talk about telehealth and I'm happy to answer questions. I am safe in my own little environment. I, 
I do my treatment. I can control who comes in and out of my home. I mean, really, the only people we allow in our home is my family. Um, we really aren't allowing anybody and even myself and my kids. I'm not allowing any of us to go into any place um, or even for my kids to go into a friend's home. And honestly, when school starts, they'll be doing remote. And so I feel thankful that I'm able to kind of encapsulate this little safe and secure bubble because of home dialysis that I would have never been able to do had I need to go into a clinic. So where did telehealth fit in for that for you? Yeah, so, um, so now with COVID, I used to go once a month into a, a clinic and go see my doctor and, and all my uh, supporting members, so my dietitian, my social worker, my home nurse. And so now I don't, we do everything on telehealth. Um, they usually will send me an email, uh, probably maybe three weeks in advance or, or even text me and say, you know, will this date and time work well for you? Um, it usually does, because where am I going now <laughs> these days? <laughs> so I say yes. Um, they'll send me an email invite and I will uh, join. But I do want to go back to um, one of the questions that, that Brett had asked, Dr. Miller had asked about, you know, patients joining with technology, because I, I agree 100%. I obviously know how to use technology and, and can get on, but I think there's lots and lots of patients that don't. And I do have a couple of suggestions that I, I think can help. Um, so, you know, Michelle had talked a little bit about, you know, doing a test run, and I think that that's a great Absolutely. idea. Um, but you know what could also help is actually a little video. If, if there could be um, either a, a home nurse, maybe something that's approved, um, that actually shows a little video on how to join a telehealth that they could even just click on and watch. Um, I, I think that there's nothing better than like a visual, like a visual learner. And so sometimes it can be hard when you're over the phone and you're like, especially if they can't even unmute themselves and you're <laughs> trying to tell them, right? So if you could in advance have a phone call with them and tell them, hey, through email, I'm going to send you a, a video that's going to show you exactly how you can join. Just watch the video. Um, and then maybe you can accompany that with some, you know, step by step directions. I think that would be really, really helpful. I know that like when I don't know how to do something, I always try to look up a video, um, you know, and try to find kind of the best way to do it. So just kind of thinking of a patient's perspective that I think would be really helpful and, and maybe right. something we can think about. Absolutely, that's wonderful. So, how do you, as a patient, prepare for your telehealth? And then uh, the last question I'll have for you is, do you want telehealth to go away and you want to go back to the clinics? <laughs> okay, so how I prepare is, um, what I try to do is have any questions that I, that I need to be thinking about with my doctors as I, I write them all down. Um, my husband is my care partner. So we do chat a little bit about like, he's, he's the one that brings me like my epigen when I do it. So I usually will confer with him and like, do we need EPO? You know, cause he's, he's kind of the one that knows that better than me, believe it or not. So, <laughs> um, so we have like a little chat about, uh, you know, supplies. Um, I usually look to see actually what supplies and things that I might need if there's anything um, that is pertinent and I need right away. Um, and so I make a little list of what I, what I want to go over with them, not only with with dialysis, but even, you know, any other things that might be going on. For instance, when it wasn't COVID, I would talk about travel, um, you know, and other needs that I that I might need help with. And actually, just lately on my last telehealth visit, um, you know, I asked my doctor to write a letter for me to have my kids work remotely um, because of COVID. So, you know, there's a bunch of things that I think about. And then in terms of, do I want to go back? No way. Um, I don't care if COVID goes away. I still don't want to go back. Um, this has been huge for me. Um, in the past, I would run to get to a doctor's appointment and I would be sitting for probably 45 minutes to an hour in the waiting room. I would go in and have maybe a you know, 20 minute appointment and then I would have another hour drive home. Um, so where a telehealth visit was really 20 minutes for me, it was like three hours, just, you know, going there and back. 
where now I feel like I'm in the comfort of my own home. I'm not rushed. I'm not thinking about traffic and trying to get back and forth. I actually feel like I have a clearer mind um, and I'm more, you know, ready to, to speak with everybody and I'm not running to try to get out of there, which I always felt like I was kind of. Right, right. So it really has made a big difference for me. Um, when I join my calls, kind of what Michelle said, sometimes it's the nurse will speak with me first and the social worker or dietitian will come on. Then the doctor will come on. Sometimes it's all of them in the same room. I guess it depends on, you know, who's there and how they do it. But, um, you know, I find the calls to be just as, um, I want to say just as successful. Everyone seems to be, you know, on point. They've got my prescriptions laid out. They've got questions for me. I honestly don't think that they're running from person to person like they were in the past where there'd be a line in the waiting room. So I, I love it and I would not want to see it go away. And that's very important because we, we need to know the patient's perspective as we move forward. But I think I'm going to ask Brent and Michelle to unmute and we'll go ahead to our uh, more of a round table discussion. I see in our questions and chats, we're a little bit slow on questions and chats and Deb, promised me that the IPRO people are really good at asking questions. So I'm expecting some to pop up here in the next few minutes. But in the meantime, Michelle, you, you went through a lot of the setup of, of how to do a telehealth visit. Is that a lot of more, is that a lot more work operation for the um, nursing and the IDT team, or is it pretty similar to what you would expect on the monthly visit anyhow? Well, I think overall the nurses find it much more efficient to do a telehealth visit. Um, some of the comments have been that, you know, because they're seeing the majority of their patients right now by telehealth, they don't have to disrupt training schedules. So a lot of times what was happening is they would have to, you know, you know, postpone or shorten a training session so that they could conduct in-person clinic visits. They said the big win for them has been a lot of times they can do telehealth visits from a conference room and they have additional space to train patients or see a patient that needs to be seen in person. So I think overall the nurses feel like it's more efficient for them. Okay. Um, it's a little bit of upfront time to, you know, get them set up, but you know, if you incorporate it into part of your training when you onboard new patients, then that solves the majority of the problem right there because you're not trying to train them um, remotely. I think that's exactly right. It's a matter of making sure the clinic runs just as smoothly. And as you said, it's got to mimic what a regular clinic looks like and we've got to provide excellent care and quality is important. While we're talking about quality, Brent, and you think about the future of telehealth, what guardrails do we need to make sure that these uh, visits are high quality and, and able to deliver the care that we, we want to see with the patients? No, I mean, I, I think I, did, I, I wish I had the answer for you then, Mike. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that's something that everyone needs to think about. Um, and I think people are waiting for an authority, whether it be the government, um, you know, Medicare, or whether it be their LDO or their local dialysis administration to say, this is how you do it. And I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think um, similar to what Vanessa says is we probably need as clinicians to reverse engineer this. And I think we need to be asking all of our patients, well, what works and what doesn't work? Um, because I think if we get a top-down answer, it's it's not gonna it's not really gonna be effective, and uh, I, I think we need to look at those things and say, well, this works and this doesn't work. Like for example, I've been we have missed some vascular access problems on our home hemo patients during COVID, and it's no one's fault. It's just that when you can't see the access and examine the access and ask those kind of questions about what's going on, it's inevitable that in some patients that will be missed. And, you know, did we look at the access via telehealth? Yes. Did we go over the flow sheets? Yes. Did we ask the same questions? We did all the same things we do in clinic, but it's not the same for that part of the exam. And so I think we have to figure out how we integrate those things into it. And, and I wish I had a better answer, but I think starting with the nurses and starting with the patients and starting with the doctors who are on the front lines and reverse engineering it is probably a better way to go. 
And I think that's right. I was just on a call with HHS where we were discussing this, and guardrails and quality are key. And the key point we made is we have to get the patient's opinion and we have to ask the patients. So, Vanessa, what do you want me to provide to you to make sure that you get a good telehealth visit every single month? Yeah, so uh, so a couple of things I want to say. Um, so the first thing I just want to make sure that I mention um, is that, you know, there are some patients that have been asked to come back in center for visits and not do telehealth. And I can just tell you from, you know, being an advocate and speaking with patients every day, they're not happy. You know, they they want to continue telehealth. So patients really like telehealth. That's what we need to know. Um, Brett, Dr. Miller, on to what you were saying specifically, so, you know, this kind of combines what you and Dr. Krauss are kind of both asking. I think if you could, if we can re-engineer and think about some of the questions, like we need to empower the patient. So you're right that you miss some things vascularly when you don't see people in person. But then again, I also want to say, shouldn't the patient, you know, know when they should be vascularly be seen? I feel, well, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. yes, but yeah. you know, not not everyone's a Vanessa. <laughs> no, and, I um, that, but but what I mean is, like, I totally think with what you're saying, a hundred percent, and and maybe those are some of the questions that we can think about, like, what are those questions to do, kind of the deep dive, right. so patients are really thinking about, you know, not only is my venous and arterial axis okay, am I, am I bleeding too long? Should I measure how high, you know, like the, like, should I measure my fistula? Like, I don't know. I, I actually don't know. I'm just um, like saying some, some things in place because I feel like for me, if, if the doctor said to me, okay, every time that we do our telehealth, um, for, we're going to have like subjects that we talk about. So one is going to be your overall well being, how are you feeling, et cetera, right? And then um, another might be from the social worker, which is family and then medication. But maybe there's another subsequent that is, you know, fistula um, or access. Not, I have a fistula, so I said that, but let's just say access in general. Like, these are the questions that I want you to be able to answer, right? Like, how is your blood flow going? Have you been bleeding longer? If you have a, you know, longer than usual. Um, you know, or can you, or clotting quicker, or those kind of things that maybe as patients, we don't really think about all the time. I know I don't always think about it. And so if there were kind of some buckets that we had to answer some specific questions, and, and then we would know like month over month kind right. of how we're doing. So, so Michelle, from your standpoint, you know, uh, I run quality for a large dialysis organization. Are there things that we can do to help the patients understand their access even better? Yes, absolutely. I think there's a couple of things. First and foremost, I think it goes back to how we train and educate our patients to do a good thorough physical assessment. Because if they understand that right from the beginning and they're taught to how to assess and what to listen for, they'll pick up on things way faster than actually we will because they pay attention to it and see it every day. They're looking at one access. So they notice very, very subtle changes, usually before right. we do. But that, that takes, you know, obviously you have to educate the patient and spend some time so they understand what they're looking for. The other thing is I think we need to make sure that we're using technology to our full advantage. And that goes back to you know, we sometimes don't always do the best job of technique surveillance. And, you know, we ask the patient maybe, okay, you know, walk me through how you do your access care. But in my mind, there's an opportunity for us to actually see what they're right. doing. So schedule a telehealth visit. And, you know, that's where having a care partner um, there to hold the camera and watch them do their initiation of dialysis so that you can see if they're breaking technique. Um, because one of the biggest concerns for me is infection. A lot of times that's where patients have complications is they're missing a step in, you know, cleaning their access or if they use buttonhole removing their scabs. So I think those two things are the most important things we can do for our patients is educating them well on a fit really good physical exam 
and assessing their technique over time. We always yeah. pick up shortcuts. I, I agree. I mean, it, when, when I took care of patients and practiced aggressively, my patients usually called me with access problems. I didn't make the diagnosis. So we were able to manage the access problems when they were brought up. Uh, Brent, Kim Davis has got a good question. She uses Zoom for her telehealth. And I know you've talked to a lot of people around the country. Are there other platforms being used? Is everybody using Zoom? Everybody using Facebook? What's going on? You're Brent, you're Brent, you're muted. See, the, when the patient goes on the telehealth, that's if you've got to train them to go off mute. Go ahead. <laughs> Point. Um, so that's a great question. I, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I've used almost all the platforms um, that are out there. So Davida uses one that's integrated with Falcon, which is their EMR. Fresenius has used Microsoft Teams. Um, the, um, some of the independent units have used FaceTime. Um, they've used Doximity and then their Doximity's platform, which is called DoxyMe. Um, on, on the CKD side, we've used a product called Amwell. We've used DoxyMe. We use the Doxy Caller. We've occasionally used FaceTime. Um, we have, I think you're right, I think I've used Zoom a couple times. To be honest with you, we've had some troubles with Zoom in my organization um, that it's not worked. It hasn't been as reliable as we'd like. So we have not, we have stopped using that for patients. Um, but I, I don't have a good answer for you. Right. Um, they've, they've all worked at times and they've all not worked at times. So, yeah, it's, it's a matter of looking at them and make sure it fits into your EMR and fits into your, your workflow. But Vanessa, I'm going to ask you a question about platforms. As, as you're probably aware, part of the waivers for PHE was to do away with the need for HIPAA compliance. Uh, and the, the platforms don't have to be HIPAA compliant as they would have been before the, the, the pandemic. Uh, as a patient doing telehealth, tell me what your thoughts on cybersecurity and personal information security as we move into this telehealth world. Sure. So, you know, I, to be honest with you, um, not that I'm not worried about um, my my HIPAA, you know, rights or cybersecurity, but to more importantly, I want to be safe and uh, and I want to be healthy. And so for me, my well-being and my safety really is going to take mainstream. And I think if you speak with most patients, they, they would say that as well. And so I don't think that I, I mean, I don't worry about that so much because I'd rather be able to see my doctor the way we are talking right. um, and, and have him check in with me um, that, than worry really about the kind of cyber and HIPAA compliance piece. Now, Michelle, as a dialysis organization, how do you feel about those sort of things? Well, as a dialysis organization, <laughs> there's a large concern around that. However, I think we need to be just smart and mindful about, you know, what we're sharing, um, how we're scheduling the calls. You know, I think being very mindful of sending individual invitations to patients so that another patient couldn't inadvertently join the same call. Like some common sense things, I think, um, reduce your risk a lot. Um, I do think there is more opportunity to share information virtually. So I'm a big proponent of patients being able to take pictures of things and send them to their nurse. Um, and I know that, you know, all of that has to be secured and has to be able to be documented at some point. But I do think we have to think outside the box when it comes to taking care of home patients and leverage technology to do a better job of supporting patients at home. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, from my point of view, I, I think it will become more and more important that we do look into and maintain things as HIPAA compliance. Uh, it, it is imperative as a caregiver to make sure that I give my patients as much safety as I can, and that includes safety over their health information as well. So I suspect as we talked about guardrails as, as the waivers come and go and, and things change after the pandemic, hopefully sometime this year, if we're lucky, um, we will we'll have to, as the government will have to look at that, and I suspect asking people to get HIPAA compliance at the at, at front is, uh, is is going to be key. Uh, Deb, did you want to bring in, looks like you had some questions for Vanessa. Correct. Can you hear me? Yes, sure can. Okay, great. Great. Um, Vanessa, we had one question for you, and it always seems we have more pay questions for the patient than anyone else. <laughs> um, 
Vanessa, would it have helped you if you had the opportunity when you were an in-center patient to go to some area of the clinic and find a unit where you could participate at different levels in your own self-care, especially like in the transition with the guided cannulation and then moving maybe to setting up the machine? Would that, would they, you feel like a transitional care program would have encouraged you in seeing that you were worthy, quote unquote, of being a home dialysis patient? I mean, absolutely. I, I would have loved to have been able to participate in something like that where I could, you know, see the machine, learn more about it. Like you said, set it up, do a piece on cannulation, um, all those pieces that I could have kind of walked through and known a little bit more about. Um, I was unfortunately not able to do that. I mean, I still luckily got home and I'm happy that I'm home, but that is really one of the best ways for patients to learn about home it's so that they can take part in their care and they learn about all modalities of home, right? So right. I, I do home hemo, but you know, perhaps PD would have been better. I don't know. Um, it, it's nice to be able to learn about all the modalities and what it looks like, what it feels and kind of go through it so that you really can make the best, um, most informed, educated decision. So yes, absolutely. And, and Deb, I, and most people don't know this, but Michelle Carver has been involved in transitional care uh, a long time and has been the expert I usually go to when I have questions. What, for transitional care, what are your goals? Goals for transitional care is primarily because a lot of our patients are either new to dialysis or they're transferring from a modality that is no longer working is to stabilize the patient so that they are clinically stable to think about what their next modality. That's first and foremost um, in my mind for transitional care is we want to get them back to a place where they can actually learn and be educated. The second piece is to provide some pretty intensive education so that they can make the decision that's right for them. Um, and they have some time to kind of look and see what are the options, what's going to fit, and they're not asked to make that decision immediately. I think one of the biggest benefits of the transitional care program is to make the patient feel comfortable in understanding their fluid balance and what their blood pressure means and what these medications mean so when they do go home, possibly, you know, and doing a telehealth um, visit, they are able to communicate with their physician in a way that they feel comfortable and they've learned about. And um, I think that that would probably alleviate some of our questions on the line about whether you need to have an electronic stethoscope to conduct an adequate um, visit or not, or whether other assessment tools should be, electronic assessment tools should be included. Um, do you have any thoughts on whether you do need to include electronic stethoscopes if the patient is well trained or? So, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. First of all, we'll, we'll see technology continue to improve. So what we do today is going to be very rudimentary to what we do in two, three, and four years. Uh, and it's exciting to see this come. There, there are a lot of remote monitoring uh, processes that are out there that are coming to us, and they're now getting to a price point where we'll be able to use them for either short periods of time or longer periods of time. CMS is now looking at how to reimburse for the physician's time in, in interpreting those kind of things. So th this is it's an exciting time. Uh, when you look at how to care for a patient, most of us feel today we don't need a remote stethoscope. They're a little expensive. They're a little hard to hear. Some are good, some not as good. Um, but, uh, you know, we are open to a, a large array of data in their electronic medical record. Uh, we train them to do a very good job of physical exam and taking care of themselves. And, and we use a lot of the, the questions and, and the remote monitoring of labs and blood pressures to suffice. Obviously, if we're concerned, blood pressure's rising, weight's going up, 
that patient probably needs to come in so we can get a physical exam, understand what we need to do to dry weight if we're not able to get them better. Uh, Michelle, did you have a thought on that? Well, I would just say it kind of goes back to a well-trained patient mm -hmm. and their ability to assess and troubleshoot issues at home. And I, I, at least for me and home, really where the success was, was looking at the trends. Um, so really looking at the patient's treatment records and their weights and their blood pressure, to me, that is the most meaningful interventions you're going to provide for the patient, not necessarily me listening to their heart that one time um, through a stethoscope that might not be as adequate as in person. So I'm a big believer in really listening to the patient. What are they seeing? What are they documenting? Um, that's going to help drive, I think, some of the treatment interventions that the physician and the nurse and the social worker and the dietitian feel they need to make. Um, we did send out some pre-work questions, and I, I really feel that all of them were covered, but I do want to share some of the... Um, we did ask one question, what do you wish you knew about telehealth at the onset of using it during the pandemic that you know now? And I think one of the um, best responses that we got multiple times is that telehealth and the use of applications should be included in the emergency education planning that we do with patients who go home. Back um, when I was doing home dialysis, we talked about the seven-day diet and we talked about where would you go and who would you call if there was an emergency. But if we talked about telehealth and how we were going to use it, not just in emergencies, but going forward and actually incorporated that in the education. And I, I do have one of my um, uh, providers of this information saying that they are actually developing that to thread into the information that a patient gets before they go home. So you can work out the kinks with the technology you can have a practice one-on-one -on -one clinic visit before it actually is you're on stage. And I think that is important, especially in disaster. I'll tell you, at, at our organization, we, we do work with a company. We, we have drones that can provide Wi-Fi to areas after, say, a, a hurricane hits. So you can become connected even if the phone lines don't work. Hopefully, we'll be able to connect with you and help take care of you. So it's, it's got to be part of the emergency disaster planning. Right. And as far as Vanessa, um, I just want to say, Vanessa, almost all of the clinics report that their patients have at least 50% of the, their patients that do not want to come back to clinic. They would like to continue with telehealth. Um, the only caveat would be is that they would want a little bit more education about what to do and who, what topics should they prepare for, even though they've been through routine clinic visits and it's pretty much the same every time, they just fit, feel a little put on the spot and yeah. that the training could be improved with checklists or guides of some sort. But so, most yeah, of the patients don't want to come back to see. Well, I, I agree. I mean, I, I am one of those patients that don't want to come back, but I, I could see where uh, a little checklist that you give to your patient, that's what I was saying. We're going to go right. through medication. We're going to go through access. We're going to go through well-being, that, that they just know that, and they don't have to kind of think on the spot sometimes because it, it does sometimes put you on like, oh, I have nothing else to talk about, you know, so... Um, I, I can see where a little checklist that you send out beforehand to the patient um, would be very helpful. Um, and that, that gets the patient ready to prepare for what they're going to be speaking about. Right. Um, I, I think that we're going to try to unmute Kimberly Davis, Davis okay. so that she can um, share her experience at the Rogerson Institute. And, for those of you who don't know where the Rogerson Institute is, it's in New York State. And um, it was in the height of the worst part of the pandemic. So I'm asking Michelle if you could try to un Kimberly. I 
I, I, I think I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted? <laughs> yes, you are. I can hear you. I've been waiting to talk for a long time. Um, <laughs> so I, um, I, in, I know Dr. Krause and Vanessa very well, Michelle Carver. Um, so no need to provide this direction of where, who I am or where I came from. Um, so in regard to um, telehealth, I can tell you that the patient satisfaction level has gone through the roof. Um, and in an urban area, you know, we have patients that travel into the city. Um, this New York City was the hot zone for COVID. And um, some of the things we did immediately with telehealth was a shelter in place with them. Um, and I agree, like, you know, Vanessa doing everything from telehealth was really important. Uh, we actually utilized our like as admins and our unit clerks to do the pre call right. training on the telehealth. So it doesn't have to be a nurse, which I would highly suggest. So we had a, an office administrator who would walk you through how to do Zoom or, you know, whatever, you know, uh, platform, you, you know, that you were uh, using um, to Deborah's point. I highly agree that any patient motivated to learn something, do something to move toward home is really important. Um, we actually had patients that were COVID positive that wanted to go home. Um, actually, one of them who chronically tested positive, and it was an effort to get him out of the clinic, but I, I used telehealth for his initial home visit to make sure that his apartment was okay. I used telehealth to connect with him, to give him education while he was stuck on a COVID shift. Um, I didn't want him to lose motivation to go home and he's presently in home training. So, you know, at this point, we did not stop training. Uh, you know, any patient that wanted out of the unit, we put them home because we okay. felt that their fear of COVID or anything else was a motivator that may have superseded any other, you know, motivator in the past. And um, we kind of took advantage of that in displaying that, you know, our data with uh, patients that get COVID and are on home dialysis was so low during an epidemic period of time that um, I have 320 patients that I manage and I have four that were actually sick or positive at this point. So, you know, like Dr. Krause said, you know, people are fearful of needles. I think they're more fearful of COVID. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, to Michelle's point, I think, you know, we've actually done some training with PD and particularly uh, when PD catheters are starting to be placed. And I think that um, there needs to be a, a, a lot of guardrails around it, but We've actually telehealth trained PD patients in the first two weeks of the flush period um, where we were educating them and giving them aprons, dummy tummies, things like that to practice with. Um, and I know Dr. Krause that the initial call we had with CMS being on there, they were really panicked about that. You know, um, so I think more can be done with the right. pre-training. Um, and I think that it just needs to be provided in a way where it, we can demonstrate safety and whether it's a pilot or something else that there's some kind of criteria put in place. Um, to Vanessa's point, um, my experience in knowing Vanessa and other advocates for years, it's been the basis of my practice that I'm always looking for new things to assist patients and have them put their input in. But with telehealth, I did find that they were enormously focused. And I think that your visit is a higher quality than the patient actually coming into the clinic at this point. So, you know, um, I am volunteering to do the initial demonstration of telehealth <laughs> video. <laughs> Thank you for that suggestion, Vanessa, because, you know, that's, you know, we use Zoom, which is PHI protected. Um, and to Dr. Krause's point, you know, we have to figure out ways with patients that don't have bandwidth to participate in, um, in telehealth visits, but, you know, we're getting around that. And I think that the, your creative people always win. So I want to thank all of you <laughs> for 
being on here. I've known you for a long time, and you're a value of information for everyone. Thanks. And I know we're short on time, Deb, but before we go, I wanted to thank everybody for participating and staying on with us. I know we're a little bit over, uh, and it, it, I think it's been very informative. I, I do want to remind everybody that, that while we focused on the patient-physician relationship on telehealth and a little bit on the patient-nurse, telehealth is a powerful tool for all of our IDT to use. Our social workers can speak to patients and patients' families without having to get them to the office. Our dietitians can be useful when patients want. You can, you know, if the patient says, gee, I, I, I'd love for you to see what my pantry looks like to see what food groups I can avoid, that works too. So there's lots of things we can do. I think the future is wide open. Uh, Seema Verma did say the genie was out of the bottle long before Brent Miller did. Uh, and clearly, the, they said we cannot go backwards. So the goal at this point is to figure out what we need to continue that we're doing today, what we need to back down from what we're doing today, and how we make sure that we ensure quality communication and collaboration so the telehealth experience remains better or at least as good as a face-to-face. -face. But thanks for inviting us, Deb, and uh, thanks for everybody for staying on. And, and most importantly, thanks to Vanessa, Michelle, and Brent, even though he's off right now. Thank you very much to all of our speakers, and we hope that everybody has a pleasant evening, and thank you for joining us. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye